What was the philosophy, the journey that took you to becoming a Buddhist monk? And what, uh, what, were, what did you learn about life? What did you take away from that experience? How did you return back to Harvard and uh, the world that's unlike that experience, I imagine? Yeah, well, I was at Dartmouth at the time. Um, uh, well, I went to Sri Lanka. I was already pretty interested in developing countries and sort of under-resourced areas. And uh, I was doing a lot of engineering work and I went there, but I was also starting to think maybe health was something of interest. Um, and uh, so I went to Sri Lanka uh, because I had a long interest in Buddhism as well, just kind of interested in it as a thing. Which aspect of the philosophy attracted you? I would say that the, the thing that interested me most was um, was really this idea of kind of a butterfly effect of like, uh, you know, what you do now has ripple effects that extend out beyond what you can possibly imagine, um, both in your own life and in other people's lives. And in some ways, Buddhism has, not in some ways, in a pretty deep way, Buddhism has that as part of its underlying uh, philosophy in terms of rebirth and sort of the, your actions today propagate uh, to others, but also propagate to to sort of uh, what might happen in, in your circle of what's called samsara and rebirth. And um, I, don't, I don't know that I subscribe fully to this idea that uh, we are reborn, uh, which always was a little bit of a of a, a debate internally, I suppose, when I was a monk. Um, but it, but it has always been, it was that, and then it was also meditation. Um, at the time I was a fairly elite rower. I was, you know, rowing at the national level and, um, and rowing to me was very meditative. It was, um, you know, just there's, even if you're in a boat with other people, it's, I mean, on the one hand, it's like the extreme of like a team sport, but it's also the extreme sort of focus and concentration that requires um, that's required of it. And so I was always really into just meditative type of things. I was doing a lot of pottery too, which was also very meditative. And and so Buddhism just kind of really, really, there are a lot of things about meditating um, that just uh, appealed. And so I moved to Sri Lanka planning to only be there for a couple of months. Um, but then I was shadowing in this medical clinic and there was this physician who was just really I mean, it's just kind of a horrible situation. Um, frankly, this guy was trained decades earlier. He was an older physician. And he was still just practicing like these fairly barbaric approaches to medicine because he had, you know, it was a rural town. And he just didn't have a lot of, um, he didn't have any updated training, frankly. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I just remember this like girl came in with like shrapnel in her hand. And his solution was to like air it out. And so he was like, Without even numbing her hand, he was uh, uh, like cutting it open more with this idea that like the more oxygen and and, yeah. and stuff, you know, and it just, I think there was something about all of this. And I was already talking to these monks at the time. Each I would be in this clinic in the morning and I'd go and uh, my idea was to teach English to these monks in the evening. Uh, it turned out I'm a really bad English teacher. <laughs> Uh, so they just taught, they they allowed me just to sit with them and, and meditate. And they were teaching me more about Buddhism than I could have possibly taught them about English or <laughs> being an American yeah. or something. Um, and, uh, and, and so I just slowly, I just couldn't take, I like couldn't handle being in that clinic. So more and more, I just started moving to, you know, spending more and more time at this monastery. And then after about two months, I was supposed to come back to the States and I decided I didn't want to. So I moved to this monastery in the mountains, um, primarily because I didn't have the money to like just keep living. <laughs> so living in a monastery is free. Yeah. And so I moved there and just started meditating more and more. And then months went by, and and I, it just really gravitated. I, I gravitated to the whole to the whole notion of it. I mean, it became. It sounds strange, but you know, meditating almost just like anything that you put your mind to became exciting. You know, it became like there weren't enough hours in the day to meditate. Mm. And I would do it for, you know, 18 hours a day, 15 hours a day. Uh, just sit there and you, and like, I mean, I hate sleeping anyway, um, but I wouldn't want to go to sleep because I felt like I didn't accomplish what I needed to accomplish in meditation that day, which is so strange because there is no end. 
you know, but it was always, but there are these, uh, there are these steps that happen during meditation that are very prescribed in a way. Buddha talked about them, you know, and these are ancient writings which exist. I mean, the writings are real. They're thousands of years old now. And, um, you know, the, so whether it was Buddha writing them or whoever, you know, the, mm -hmm. there are lots of different people who have contributed to the, to these writings over the years. And, um, but they're very prescribed and they, um, they tell you what you're going to go through. And I didn't really focus too much on them. Uh, I read a little bit about them, but your mind really does when you actually start meditating at that level, like not an hour here and there, but like truly just spending your days meditating, it becomes kind of like this other uh, world where it becomes exciting and uh, and you're actively working, you're actively meditating, not just kind of trying to quiet things. That's sort of just the first stage of trying to get your mind to focus. Most people never get past that first stage, especially in our culture. Could you briefly summarize what's waiting beyond the stage of just quieting the mind? Is well, yeah. it's hard for me to imagine that there's a, something that could be described as exciting on there. Yeah, it's it's an interesting question. So I would say, um, so the first thing, the first step is truly just to like be able to close your eyes, focus on your breath, and not have other thoughts enter into your mind. That alone is just so hard to do. Like I couldn't do it now if I wanted, um, but I could then and. Um, but once you get past that stage, you start entering into like all these other, you go through the kind of, like, I went through this like pretty trippy stage, mm -hmm. which is a little bit euphoric, um, where you just kind of start not hallucinating. I mean, it wasn't like some crazy thing that would happen in a movie, where you, but definitely just weird. You start getting into the stage where um, uh, you, you're able to quiet your mind for so long, for hours at a time that... Um, like for me, I started uh, getting really excited about this idea of mindfulness, which is part of um, part of Buddhism in general, but it's part of Theravada Buddhism in particular for this in this way, which was um, uh, you take uh, you start focusing on your daily activities, whether that's sipping a cup of tea or walking or you know sweeping around. Uh, I lived in uh, on this mountainside in this cottage thing. It was built into the rock and. Um, you know, so every morning I would wake up early and sweep around it and stuff because that's just what we did. Um, and you start to, you meditate on all those activities. And one of the things that was so exciting, which sounds completely ridiculous now, was just um, almost learning about your daily activities in ways that you never would have thought about before. So what is in what what's what's involved with like picking up this glass of water? You know, if I said, okay, I'm just going to pick, I'm going to take a drink of water, to me right now, it's a single activity, right? Mm -hmm. You just, but um, during, a, during meditation, it's not a single activity. It's a whole series of activities of like little engineering feats mm -hmm. um, and feelings. And it's, it's gripping the water and it's feeling that the glass is cold and it's lifting and it's moving and dragging and dragging. And, and you start to learn a whole new language of life. Mm -hmm. And that to me was like this really exhilarating thing that um, it was an exhilarating component of meditation that uh, there was never enough time. Uh, it's kind of like learning a new computer language. Like yeah. it gets really exciting when you start coding and all these new things you can do. You, you, you learn how to much, to experience life in a much richer way. And so you never run out of ways to go deeper and deeper and deeper in the way you experience even just the, the drinking of the glass of water. That's, that's exactly right. And what becomes kind yeah. of exhilarating is um, you start to be able to predict things that you never, or I don't even know if prediction's the right word, but I always think of the matrix, you know, or, where um, I forget who it was, somebody was shooting at Neo and he like leans backwards and he yeah. dodges the bullets. Um, you know, in some ways, when you start breaking every little action that your hands do or that your feet do or that your body does down into all these little actions that make up one, what we normally think of as an action, all of a sudden you can start to see things almost in slow motion. I like to think of it very much like language. The first time somebody hears a foreign language, uh, it sounds really fast usually. You don't hear the spaces between words. And, um, and it just sounds like, just like a stream of 
conscious. And it just sounds like a stream of noises if mm -hmm. you've never heard the language before. And as you learn the language, you hear clear breaks between words and it starts to gain context. And, and all of a sudden like that, what once sounded very fast slows down and it has meaning. That's our whole life. Well, there's this whole language happening that we don't speak generally. Um, but if you start to speak it and if you start to learn it and you start to say, hey, I'm picking up this glass is actually 18 little movements, then all of a sudden like it becomes extremely exciting and exhilarating to just just breathe. You know, breathing alone and the rise and fall of your abdomen or the way the air pushes in and out of your nose becomes almost interesting. Um, and what's really neat is uh, is the world just starts slowing down. Mm-hmm. And um, I'll never forget that feeling. And it's the if there was one euphoric feeling from meditation, I want to gain back. Um, but I don't think I could without really meditating like that again. And I don't think I will. Um, was this like slow motion of the world? It was finding the spaces between all the movements in the same way that the spaces between all the words happen. And then it almost gives you this new appreciation for everything, <laughs> you know, it was like, it was really amazing. And so I think um, uh, it came to an abrupt end though, when the tsunami hit, I was there in the Indian Ocean tsunami hit in 2004. And it was like this dichotomy of being a monk and, and you know, just meditating in this extraordinary place. Um, and then the tsunami hits and kills 40,000 people in a few minutes on the coast of this really small little country in Sri Lanka. And, um, you know, then I, I, it like my whole world of being a monk came crashing down. Uh, when I go to the coast and I, I mean, that was just a devastating visual site an emotional site, but the strangest thing happened, which was that everyone just wanted me to stay as a monk. You know, people in that culture, um, they wanted to, the, the monks largely fled from the coastlines, uh, those, you know, and, and, um, and so then there I was, and people wanted me to be a monk. They wanted me to stay on the coast, but be a monk and not help, like not help in the, in the way that I considered helping. Uh, they wanted me just to keep meditating so that they could bring me dana, like, like offerings and get, and have their sort of karmic responsibilities, um, uh, attended to as well. And so, uh, that was really bizarre to me. It was like, how could I possibly just sit around while all these people, half of everyone's family just died. And uh, so in any case, I, I stopped being a monk and I moved to this refugee camp and lived there for another six months or so. And, uh, and just stayed there, uh, not as a monk, um, but tried to raise some money from the U.S. and tried to like, I didn't know what I was doing. Frankly, I was 22 and uh, and I don't think I appreciated at the time how much of a role I was having in, the, in that community's life. Uh, but it's taken me a lot, many years to process all of this <laughs> since then. But uh, I would say it's what put me into the public health world, seeing, living in that refugee camp and that difference that happened, you know, from being a monk to being in this devastating environment um, just really changed my whole view of what sort of why I was existing, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs>